Okay, today we're going to look at what the Earth actually looks like. This is going to be a fairly brief introduction. The surface of the Earth is 71% ocean and 29% continents. The surface rocks on the continents are primarily silicates, which are made out of silicon and four oxygens in a tetrahedral shape that you can see right here. They go into almost all of the rock forming minerals. Surface layers that have been suggest subjected to water and wind erosion, volcanic repaving, subduction of the crust into the mantle, and uplift of the mountains. And you can see all those pictures here. The crust is the outermost layer of the planet. It varies from 5 kilometers thick under the oceans to a maximum of 60 kilometers thick under certain mountain ranges on the continents. The composition of the crust is relatively well known from observations at the surface and from mines and boreholes that we have created. In most places, a thin layer of sedimentary rocks covers mostly granite-like or granitic rocks of the continental crust. The oceanic crust under the layers of marine sediments is composed mostly of darker and denser rocks similar to basalt, so they're called basaltic rocks. The Earth's interior is hot and dense. Weight of the upper layers presses on the interior, and the extreme compression leads to extreme heating. Although we have explored the whole surface of the Earth and have traveled thousands of miles into space, we have barely penetrated the ground beneath our feet. The deepest drill holes we have managed are about 10 kilometers deep, which is one-tenth of one percent of the Earth's diameter. The solid layers of the Earth and increasing heat and pressure within the Earth have prevented direct observations of its interior. By using observations within the upper layers of the Earth, however, we can infer information about its interior. Earth has a layered structure. The boundaries between the layers are called discontinuities. The layered structure is determined from studies of how seismic waves behave as they pass through the Earth. P and S wave travel times depend on the properties of rock materials through which they pass. The differences in the time travels of the different types of waves correspond to differences in rock properties. Seismic wave velocity depends on the density and elasticity of the rock. Seismic waves travel faster in denser rock and slower in less dense rock. Speed of the seismic waves increases with depth because the pressure and density increase downward. Please note on this picture that there are curved wave paths indicating a gradual increase in density and seismic wave velocity with depth. Also note the sharp refraction or bending of the waves at the discontinuities or boundaries between the layers. If you look here, you'll see also a shadow zone. There's a large S wave shadow zone um, down here labeled no direct S waves extending across the side of the globe opposite from the epicenter from about 105 degrees onward. S waves can't travel through the molten or liquid outer core. There's a smaller P wave shadow zone seen on both sides, which is the gray shading on this picture, from 105 degrees to 140 degrees. The P wave shadow zone makes a ring around the globe. Major layers of the Earth were detected before 1950, and finer details were delineated in the 1960s by observing the behavior of seismic waves generated during nuclear testing. As the earthquake waves travel toward the Earth's center, they can reach a layer in which their speed suddenly increases. The Yugoslavian geophysicist Andrea Mohorovic discovered the change and postulated that it marked the interface or boundary between the rocks of the crust and a denser layer. This interface is called the Moho or the Mohorovic discontinuity. The layer below the Moho is the Earth's mantle. The mantle is thought to include the majority of the Earth's volume. We have inferred its composition from a variety of observations. Last lecture I talked about how Eratosthenes determined the circumference of the Earth and how we use that to calculate the volume of the Earth. The mass of the Earth has been calculated from the measurements of gravitational attraction, and with both mass and volume data we have determined that the Earth's density total is about 5.5 grams per cubic centimeter. 
Earthquakes travel faster in the mantle, which is past the Moho discontinuity, than they do in the crust. The composition of magmas from deep within the earth include a high proportion of dense mafic, which means rich in magnesium and iron, minerals. A large proportion of the meteorites that fall to earth are composed of mafic minerals. And scientists believe that these meteorites are the remains of the material from which the earth formed billions of years ago. If they are, then they should show an overall composition similar to that of the Earth. The mantle is between 100 to 2900 kilometers deep. It is a layer of soft, mushy, silicate rock and composes two-thirds of the mass of the Earth. All of these observations suggest that the mantle is composed mostly of the dark, dense, mafic minerals, olivine and pyroxene, and you can see two of those here. Now we're going to journey to the center of the Earth, not this one, the real one. The deepest layers of the Earth are known as the outer and inner cores. The composition of these layers is thought to be a mixture of iron and nickel. These elements are abundant in some meteorites and are relatively dense. It is logical because we think we know about differentiation that the dense, densest materials would sink to the Earth's center. The process of differentiation means that you start with a molten mix of metals and minerals, and the heavy mi metals, sorry, the heavier metals, iron and nickel, sink to the center, and lighter minerals, which are the silicates, float to the surface. And this is an important process that is seen in rocky bodies throughout the solar system, not just in Earth. The inner core is solid. It is between 5,100 and 6,370 kilometers deep. It is composed of si solid iron and nickel at about 7,000 degrees Kelvin. It's kept solid by high pressure, which is called pressure freezing. The inner core composes 2% of the mass of the Earth and floats in the middle of a molten outer core. We think that the inner core is solid based on the speed of the earthquake waves, which travel faster through solid objects than through liquids. The earthquake waves that hit the inner core are registered as relatively faster to the ones that do not hit the inner core, based on measurements on the opposite side of the planet from an earthquake's origin. The outer core is molten, and it's 2,900 to 5,100 kilometers deep. Molten iron and nickel and dissolved silicon and oxygen are what compose the outer core, and this makes up 30% of the mass of the Earth. We're pretty sure that the outer core is liquid because it slows down certain earthquake waves and deflects others that can't travel through liquids on the surface of, the, um, of this dust continuity. Convection currents get set up in the molten outer core because of the bottom to top difference in temperature. There's a hot base at the solid in inner core that's made of iron and a cooler at the top of the outer core and the base of the mantle. That gives us a geodynamo. This is the flowing electricity that is conducted in the iron fluid that sets up this dynamo and generates a strong magnetic field for the entire planet. The Earth's magnetic field extends beyond the surface into a magnetosphere that interacts with the solar winds. In conclusion, the Earth is a dynamic, actively evolving planet. The surface of the Earth has been shaped and reshaped over billions of years by the forces of plate tectonics and weathering. Most of the surface is relatively young, a few tens or hundreds of millions of years old for the most part. It is active today because the Earth's interior is still hot and molten. It started out in a hot molten state of formation and continues to, to continue on this way today and about 80% of the crustal heat comes from radioactive decay of the minerals in, in the mantle and the crust. Okay, so that concludes this lecture of what the Earth actually looks like, and uh, we will continue on next lecture with the way we map the Earth. Have a great day.